All right, it is time to fix our eyes on Jesus this morning. Please stand with us as we begin to worship. We cry out, holy is the Lord. Let's pray. <laughs> up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now, how great, how awesome is He, and together we sing, holy is the Lord, holy is We could 
July now, so it's this month, um, and we have just an awesome opportunity to welcome kids on our campus and adults um, to just tell them about how much Jesus loves them, and it doesn't get much more simple than that, but it doesn't get any more beautiful than that either, and so we have opportunities for every single person, no matter your age, no matter your ability, um, <coughs> Jesus has a place for all of that, and we have a place for all that to serve at BBS. Um, so we have sign-up sheets out in the lobby. Um, we still need volunteers. So if you haven't signed up, it's not too late. It's never going to be too late to help out. Um, we'll always need more help. We'll always need more people here to love on these kids. Um, but if you would like to volunteer, we ask that you do please sign up. Do get in contact with Pastor Katie, with Emma, with somebody, um, because we also have some procedures that we need to follow through with. Um, because we want to be able to let people know that their kids are going to be safe on this place. So please do that. Um, don't be afraid to do that. And don't be intimidated um, by anything because we've got, again, something for everybody. And either way, just please be praying over that. Be praying over those three days. It's going to be July 16th, 17th through the 19th from 6 to 8.30. Yes, I got that right. Um, and so it's just going to be great for volunteers. We're going to have dinner for you. So if you get off work at five, don't even worry about it. We've got dinner for you and your family um, if you come and help serve that night. So we're just very excited for that. Um, and please, please just partner with us in it. 
that's that's all we're asking. We're not going to put this crazy heavy burden on you. We just want you to help us love on kids and just be Jesus. That's, that's it. So, with that being said, Pastor Aaron. Amen. Well, it's good to see you all. Glad you're here. If this is your very first time at Northside, we say welcome. Glad you're here on this holiday weekend. Uh, happy July 2nd, but we're celebrating July 4th, and so uh, it is amazing and awesome to remember that we live in a great country. Wow, I thought I was going to get a little more than that, because um, there are those of um, our fellow believers that are in other parts of the world that cannot celebrate like we celebrate, that cannot worship like we worship, that cannot come to a gathering like this without being heavily, heavily persecuted, or even... Um, not even make it to the building because people know. So uh, we live in a great country amidst all of the things that we see on TV and all of the things that are going on. We live in a great country and we have been blessed. Um, and I know many of you have stories. Maybe you weren't born here in America and you have amazing stories of how you have come here. And this is now your home. And so uh, so not only do we celebrate this amazing um, day and week. And I know there's going to be food and family and fireworks. That's kind of a cool Food, family, and fireworks. All right, that's cool. Um, and we can even throw fellowship in there. Um, and so, um, but there's all of those things that we're going to, to do on Tuesday. But we do need to repause, and we need to say, we live in a great country. There is that familiar song that's sung all the time at baseball games and other places. God bless America. That's not just one of those flippant things, but man, we, let me just say this, we need God to continue to bless America as well. Amen? And we need also... God, to help the believers, the church, to rise up and say, you know what, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And in God, we trust in all things. And so uh, as believers and as Jesus followers, as Jesus presence carriers, we get to bring that wherever we are at. And so we're just going to pause here this morning. I'm going to ask our ushers if they'll make their way forward uh, as we are going to take up our offering. We're going to celebrate this. There's going to be a video that's going to play while the offering is taking place. And then we're going to ask you to stand afterwards and we're going to continue to worship. But we just, again, we want to pause and, and just thank God for this amazing country that we live in and celebrate what he is doing even here today. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We give you all the glory and the honor. God, we thank you for this wonderful place that we call home here in America. And God, we're, we do have amazing, amazing freedoms that uh, were, were built and established through you. And so, God, we thank you. We ask that you would be with our president and our vice president and all of those members and cabinet members in Congress and, and all the way down to our local governments as well. Jesus, that you would just be infused into all of those places. God, we still say, in God we trust. Um, Father, we can, we can rely on and, and we know we have to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and we, we need our governments. But Father, in you we place our trust. Amen. And so, Lord, we thank you for that again. Thank you for this amazing country that we live in, that we get to worship freely in. God, we ask that you would just bless this time as we give. Father, out of obedience, not out of have to, but out of a want to and a desire to, and we get to give to you. So, Father, bless the gifts, bless the giver. Continue to bless Northside, uh, its staff, its leadership. God, we just continue to surrender it to you and to what you have for us. We ask that you bless these next few moments as we continue to worship you now. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen, amen. If you'll turn your attention to the screen and watch the video. Freedom. It's something we cherish in this country. The idea of a free society is embedded into the very core of our nation. Many have died defending it. And many have fought diligently to preserve it. So where has it gone? We've become a nation bound by division, chained by hatred, and consumed by selfishness. There's an epidemic of violence, poverty, brokenness. Does this look like freedom? The Bible tells us we're called to be free, but it also says to use that freedom to serve one another humbly in love. Maybe that's what we're missing in America. Today, we celebrate Independence Day. Perhaps it's time we recognize that true independence is found only in a lasting dependence on God. 
where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Hallelujah. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. Please stand as we, we worship the Lord this morning, the one who set us free.
thank you, God, for sending your son so that we may walk in the freedom that you call us to. Gosh, thank you for God. Thank you for the words of that song. This is who you are. This is what you do. You love us. You save us. You lift us up into the heavenly places where we can see the things that you are doing. We can hear about what you are saying to us. And you do. You sing a new song over your children. We get to see the new thing that you're doing. And it always comes back to the root of it. That God, this is who you are. Thank you for your love this morning. Thank you for salvation. Thank you that daily we get to walk and work that out. God, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. To come together as your bride. As you continue to make us ready. Lord, as you have allowed our hearts and our minds to worship you this morning because we choose whether we are going to do that or not it's a choice that we make and we choose this day to praise you and to not allow the rocks to cry out in our place and so through that praise and worship we find rest in you we experience your presence. And so this morning, Lord, as we open up your word, whether we've heard this passage of scripture before or not, you have something for us. You have something to say through your under shepherd. We want to hear your voice this morning. And we will be quick to give you praise and glory and honor because that is what you deserve. You deserve nothing less nothing less. Jesus, be with us in this time. Tune our ears to you. Nothing more. Help our minds to be focused. Help us to fix our eyes on you. We love you and we praise you. Thank you again for allowing us to be together. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. You may be seated. And if you are in kindergarten through fifth grade, preschool through fifth grade, we are inviting you to attend Northside Kids this morning with our leaders. Have a great time. Amen. Such fun, fun times. Wow, good morning. It is so good to see you here on this amazing day. I, I, I hope that you, um, I, I don't want to say this word poorly, but use that, that worship time before the message to um, kind of prime the pump of your heart so that God can then just pour out the blessings that he has for each and every one of us. And I hope that you just don't say, oh, that's just the music before the message or you know, I don't come, I had a guy look at me and I was the worship pastor for 23 years. But he looked at me in the eyes and said, Pastor, I'm just, I love you, but I hate the worship side. And I thought, oh my gosh. I did look at him through a Holy Spirit moment. And I said, then how is it that you receive the word? Because you've already turned yourself off from the, the worship of God. So you're just going to try and worship the word anyway. So that was just a side note, a little commercial right there. Uh, we have been in a series walking through together the book of 1 Corinthians, and man, I tell you, it's a joy. It has kicked me in the teeth sometimes, and uh, has challenged me, and challenged me, and challenged me, and hopefully uh, the Word of God is doing that for you as well, but not just only challenging, but also um, encouraging, giving hope, giving life to uh, the life that we live here on this earth. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, that would be the one right after 13, right before 15. Uh, if you've missed those, any part of the series, you can jump on our uh, YouTube channel and uh, check that out. And uh, man, it's just some great, great things that have been going on. 
uh, there. As we are unpacking and walking through the book of, of, um, of the chapter 14, I, there's a lot. There's a lot. So don't just look at, when you're opening your Bible, don't look at that and go, oh my gosh, we should be down by 2.30, it's fine, I hope you brought your lunch. But um, we, we're going to unpack some of the major things and um, just talk through some things, and, and I'm just excited what, um, what God's going to show us here this morning. One of the words that you're going to see a lot <clears throat> during this passage is the word edify. Don't, don't get hung up necessarily on that word, but it simply means this, to build up. To build up. Um, and I, as I was reading, as I was processing, I want you to just, um, if you're still turning in your Bible, just look at me for just a minute. If you're writing something down, there's plenty of time to write notes, don't worry. But I want you to listen to this story um, as it kind of sets the, the tone for what's going to be going on uh, at the, the rest of the time here. Um, this is from a, um, a, an author, a theologian, a commentator. Um, his name is N.T. Wright. He is the professor at Oxford University uh, in England. Uh, but he wrote these words, and I want you to hear these words. One morning, many centuries ago, two builders went off to work. The first walked through the twisting streets of the old town until he came to the little plot of land where he was laboring steadily day by day. He was building a small but beautiful house, just big enough for himself and his family to live in. The outside wasn't anything special to look at. In that part of the world, people didn't bother with decorating um, the bits that the general public would see. But inside, everything was magnificent. Around a tiny courtyard, the walls glistened with marble. The windows and their shutters were friendly and inviting, and the room and their fittings were glorious. Only he and his family would ever see it, but for them, it would be a palace. The rest of the world could ignore them for all he cared. The second man walked down to the public square where he took his place with dozens of others working together on a new building that would fill one whole side of the square, transforming it with a sense of space and grandeur. The foreman spoke eagerly to them as he allotted them their task for one day, this one to hauling pillars into position and that one to dressing stones for the upper story and others sorting tiny colored stones for the mosaics, yet another to supervise the making of the great carved doors. Who cared what, court, what sort of house that they individually lived in? They were building a cathedral, a house of beauty, all and above all, and awe and above all prayer and worship to last a thousand years, a sign of God's love and power, an invitation to everyone to come gladly and humbly into his presence. The contrast between the two builders indicates the contrast Paul makes throughout chapter 14. Hear these words. He has prepared his hearers for this in various ways, and now he focuses on a specific issue, which though at one level it simply relates to the ordering of public worship, at another level it goes near to the heart of what he wants us to hear. So we hear in the story there's a man who builds a house for his family that they will only see the inside of. But then you see our other man who's orchestrating and is the... Uh, the foreman to build this amazing, amazing cathedral uh, for everyone to come and worship God in. And I know immediately some would say, well, it's all about we should be taking care of our own house. Absolutely, we should be taking our, uh, care of our own house. But at the same time, don't let, neglect the house of God in attending that and being a part of that. And vice versa. Don't just focus on the house of God mm, and neglect your own. And you know I'm not, I'm not talking about your physical address that structure when you walk in the door. You know I'm, ta talk I'm talking about what's inside your heart. Right. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <clears throat> and so the, the title for today's message, if you need a title, is Build Up. Build Up. We hear that phrase, you wouldn't look at me and say that, in bodybuilding, what are you building up on your body? But we tell people all the time, are you building up your savings account? Right? Right? Are you building up, you hear this a lot, are you building up your retirement? Coming in COVID and all that kind of stuff and coming out of COVID and we still hear it. Um, are you building up your immune system? <laughs> We're constantly trying to build things up. But the Apostle Paul is telling us um, in chapter 14, whatever you do, make sure that you're building up the church. There you go, Pastor, that's, that's nice, but what does that mean? I'm so glad you asked. So in chapter 14, Paul is um, 
warning the Corinthians, and he's also warning us to be careful. Listen to what I'm going about to say. Be careful with your spirit gifted gifts. Did you hear what I say? Your spirit gifted gifts. Because those things came from the spirit, but at the same time, whenever a human gets a hold of sometimes those gifts, man, things can get a little bit ugly. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. If you have that, great. There's a Bible maybe in front of you, but you'll also see it on the screen. And maybe you just want to scoop next to somebody and look on theirs as well. But here you go. Verse 1 says these words. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Now remember, we just came off of chapter 13 last week, remember, which is what? The love chapter. And it's not necessarily the love between a man and a woman. It's the love between each other as as believers in Christ. Remember, that's the preface for all of that. So follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Verse 2. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. Verse 3 says, But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies, there's that word, edifies themselves. But the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, Paul writes, but I would rather you have prophecy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be once again edified. Now, I know you're probably going, oh my gosh, Pastor, we're going into tongues, aren't we? No, we're not. Oh my gosh, Pastor, we're going into prophecies, aren't we? No, we're not. We're going into what does the Bible say about the church building one another up? That's what Paul is saying. Three times in those five verses, he uses the word edify. Now, he talks about tongues, and he talks about prophecy. But is what's being done edifying to the body? Or to the body? Rather than saying the church, say the body. It just has a little more personal of a meaning. I mean, you wouldn't call yourself, I know someone would say, we call ourselves the temple of God. We are. But you wouldn't call yourself a church. I know the church is wherever you are. I get that. But this is a body. This is a body. Why do we say body? Because it's got, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, it's got many different parts. Just look around. Aren't you glad that I'm glad that everyone in this room does not look like me? Dear Lord, y'all would be in a heap of trouble. But we are a body of many parts. Let's celebrate that. So, that first point that we're going to talk about is it says edify... And so what are we to edify? We're to edify the body. So three times Paul says this. And, he, and I know he focuses on tongues. And I know he focuses on prophecies. And again, we can get wrapped up in those um, things. Or we can say, okay, God, so what are you trying to show us in a greater picture here? Let me just stop right here and say, if you've never, uh, or if you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, and by the way, if you are a believer, if you have said, Jesus, be Lord and Savior, please forgive me for my sins, come and live in my heart, those things, that thing, whether it was at Bible school or at a church service or wherever the case, if you've never done that, you have been given spiritual gifts. Now, each one of us, again, have been given different gifts. Hallelujah, praise his name. And can you imagine if we all had the gift of, I don't know, helps, if that's one of the gifts. I mean... Yes, we would all be helping one another, but who's going to be prophesying? Who's going to be uh, leading? Who's, there's all those all the other gifts. So I'm so glad that there are different gifts there. But if you've never found out what your gifts are, I will say there are many tests that you can take. Um, and, and there are a few that I would recommend to you. But remember, remember that those tests were created by man. They are a resource. They are not something that you place your salvation in. They are a resource. And so if you've ever, if you've never found out what your gifts are, I would encourage you. Take a spiritual gifts test. I'd love to walk you through. Pastor Katie would love to walk you. Pastor Hannah, some of you others that are in here, um, Pastor Denise, I know, has walked many people through that. So uh, Pastor Marilyn as well. Just take one of those gifts, take one of those tests and find out where has God gifted you. And then here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. Just when you find out your gift, don't take it to yourself. This is the gift I have. Well, that's wonderful. How's I going to bless the body? Well, it's not. It's going to, this is the gift I have. Well, that doesn't bless the body at all. How now 
brown cow. You know I was going to say that. <laughs> how, how do I get to bless and, and be a part of the body with my gifts that God's given to me? <clears throat> if you do know what your spiritual gifts are and are not using them, I will say this to you. One question. <coughs> Why? Why? The body is, is lacking. The body is missing in those gifts, if you know that. Side note. So Paul is trying to, to encourage us. He is encouraging the Corinthians to edify, make sure that whatever you do is edifying to the body. And I know he uses the tongues and the prophecies right there in those first five verses, but those are just simply examples that he's using. But he's also stressing to them, make sure, make sure that you're just not using those gifts, if that's what you have, just for whatever case. So then he jumps into this next section. In verse 6, he jumps into a new section, and he says these words, and you'll see these words, I think, come on the screen as, as well. In verse 6, it says, Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues... What good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, listen to this, hone in on this, listen to these words or read these words. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the pipe or a harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? Listen. Listen. So it is with you, and I'll just say this, and I. Unless you speak intelligible, intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Remember in, in uh, chapter 13 where Paul says, if I speak in tongues, I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Remember that? You will be just speaking into the air, he says. Verse 10, Undoubtedly there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. Here it is. So it is with you. Since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up, once again, edify the church. I know this morning we're reading a lot of Scripture. The Scripture is alive and well, and so that's why we need to read it. So the first part was that edify or to build up. This next part that Paul is talking to is there is a clarifying. A clarify um, what? I think Paul is clarifying the call of the church. The call of the church. And so what's the call of the church? To edify the body. <laughs> Remember, to build up the body. Now, I know there are those that say, well, what about Matthew 28, where Jesus says, yes, there is that as well. Um, and so we need to remember that. But there's also a call to the body to build one another. Uh, I love the illustration that Paul uses, um, that he says there about instruments. If a trumpet plays something, this is, I'm going to go off on this just a little bit, and he just plays random notes, how will you know what to do with those notes? Are we supposed to get ready for battle? Are we supposed to retreat? Is it a sign of celebration? What is it? And so again, it's just that's what Paul is saying. There has to be some structure in that. Again, Paul even says, you know, as he said in chapter 13, am I a clanging symbol? Here, example. Very, very practical. I know you need this. This is going to be an amazing sound, and you will absolutely love it. Is this on, Brandon? You're ready to go? So listen to these. It's going to be amazing. You didn't like it? Mm -hmm. I know exactly what it is. I played three notes. You guys didn't like it at all? What if I, instead of it being just random, what if there was some order to it? I know what I played. I know exactly what it sounded like. But watch this. When there's an order to it, and there is not just randomness and there's structure to it, now, same three notes, you ready? You'll know what it is. Um. You know what that song is? You need me to keep going? Great is thy faith on this whole God. You, you recognize that. You're, it's in your head. It was intelligible to you. 
It made sense to you. It was a good sound to your ear versus... I know, maybe some of you like that, I don't know. <laughs> if so, well, we didn't talk about that. I, again, I knew what those three notes were, and I knew what I was playing, but it wasn't, didn't make any sense to you. So my question would be, what was the point of that? Ah, but when I played them with organization and with structure, it was, it was nice to everyone. And you were able to understand and hear what I was trying to play. The same is with the use of our gifts that God is and the Spirit has given to each and every one of us. Am I using my gifts so that people will look at me? I have the gift of whatever. I wear that badge well. Okay, I think Paul talked a couple of chapters before about boasting and how we're not supposed to do that, but only boast in the Lord. When I use my gifts, let me ask this, am I creating confusion for people? Again, those three notes that are, essentially they were banging together. Am I just creating confusion? Like people look at me like, okay, but man, that just didn't, how, why? Again, it goes back to point number one, am I edifying, am I building up the church? Or, the last thing, am I using my gifts so that the body of Christ is built up? Is that what the point is? So there's a clarity, there's a call to the church to build up and to edify the body of Christ. And then we get to, again, I told you this is a long chapter, in verses 13 through 25, and you can see that that's a long, um, just a bunch of, of reading, which is good, and it's very, very good. Um, Paul continues to unpack some of our gifts, especially tongues of prophecy, and that we'll have a clear understanding of what those particular gifts are. And um, again, it's just the Word of God being uh, a light to our lives. But then you get to verse 26. And <laughs> then Paul says, so it, like any good preacher, he's going to talk for 26, 25 verses and then get to the point. You know what I'm saying? And so, so then in verse 26 we see Paul begin to write out, okay, so... Now that we understand how all this is working and how it's supposed to edify the body of Christ, this is what it should look like. Here's the practicality of it. Here's what it should look like. So we find in verse 26 that he is instructing us um, how to use these gifts now all together as a family or all together as a body. So in verse 26, you see these words. It says, What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything, I love these words, everything must be done so that the church may be what? Built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak at one at a time, and someone must interpret. There's a guideline right there. One at a time, and there must be an interpreter. We're not going to get fixed on that, but we are going to say that's what... That's not what I say. That's not what the Church of God, that's not what Patrick Katie says. That's what the Bible says. Love you. If you don't like it, I take it up with him. I don't know. Anyways. So if there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Verse 29 says, Two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. Once again, Paul keeps pointing back to the point of all of this. The church has to be built up. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. And then Paul just goes like this. And he kicks in verse 33. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in the congregation of the Lord's people. So, okay, so who, who does this apply to? Well, it applies to the church, and I know you're going, well, duh, Aaron, of course it applies to the church. Who else would it come be applicable to? I think Paul is um, reminding us those scriptures right there. It is for the church, and it is for the body. Let me ask this. I think that's also for us as individuals as well. You say, what are you talking about? Remember 
that God is a God of order and God is a God of structure. And I know that sometimes, not in your life, I'm just speaking from my own perspective and you can glean and look into my life, there are sometimes that things get a little bit chaotic. And let me just say this, and sometimes, no, all the time, I create the chaos. And God says, remember me in this situation? I would love to bring peace. It's, isn't that what it says? He's a God of order, and he brings peace. Um, I, I'd like to bring that to your life if you'd let me. And then Paul is reminding us as well. I, I, I'd like to, God is saying, I'd like to bring order and peace to this body as well. So verse 26 says, everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Verse 33, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Here you go, quick application. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, my parents, um, we went to a very large Baptist church. Uh, we were not Baptist. We weren't Baptist enough for the Baptist, or we were too Baptist. No, we were not Baptist enough for the Baptist because we were too Pentecostal, but we weren't Pentecostal enough for the Pentecostals. Does that make sense? <laughs> Um, it was a very large congregation, um, and we, we had multiple services. We had two services on Sunday morning. We had a Saturday night service. It was, that Saturday night service was, it was hopping. It was kicking. Uh, it was amazing. That was the service that my family attended. And the, the congregation itself was a very, very healthy congregation. It was a very large congregation. We were probably a solid, man, 16 to 2,000 people. So a very large um, family, but, but very close. I know that doesn't make sense, but I promise you it was. Our worship pastor and our pastor, I think between the two of them, they each were at the congregation for about 30 or 35 years apiece. So there was this long tenure. There was an amazing relationship between the two of them. And, and they just led with such humility. But at the same time, if they were walking off a bridge, you were following them. Because they, that's just what God had called them to do. I remember one Saturday night, there was a moment. And many of you, if you've been in the church world, um, or been a part of worship services, there are just moments where the Holy Spirit just hits a little bit harder, you know. And, and there was just a holy hush that fell across the congregation. Remember, large congregation. And it, it was that holy hush, and then immediately in this huge auditorium, someone began to speak in tongues. And I'm thinking, oh Jesus. I mean, I was, I was old enough to know, but I, I, I wasn't. And, you know, I mean, that's not what Baptists do, and Dear God, you know, Brits is not a Pentecostal church, so what in the world? And, and it was rather lengthy. It was probably 30 seconds long. And our worship pastor, Bill, I'm not going to say his name because he was an amazing man of God, um, spoke over my life, and, but he just simply stood up, right, came right from the pulpit, and he said, so we've had a word. Is there an interpreter? Immediately someone stood up and began to interpret. And I, I wish you could see my arms. It, it was the most powerful thing I've ever been a part of. Because Bill got up and he said, so there's been a word, and so here at Park Avenue, we're going to be biblical, and the Bible says that there must be an interpreter, and so I'm going to call for an interpreter. And the interpreter spoke. And it was not only for uh, the church as a whole, but it was also a specific word for our pastor. I'm, I'm, golly, that was amazing. Uh, it was amazing. That's correct in how that worked. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. There was another time, again, same congregation, same context, not the same service, that someone began to speak in tongues, and um, once again, our worship pastor came up to the front and said, so I'm going to be biblical about this, and I'm going to ask, is there an interpreter? It's okay. Nothing. Nothing. And he said, brother... We appreciate you. We love you, but we're going to have, we're going to be biblical about this, and we're just going to simply ask you to to sit down. Like, and and he did, and we went right on with the service. Let me just say this as well: that was biblical as well. Why? Because Paul specifically says, "If without tongues, what is it? I'm a clanging gong." It was this right here. It made no sense to anybody. Now, someone could say, "Well, you weren't you weren't living in the spirit, Aaron. You didn't understand." Well, that's not for me to judge, but I know what the Bible says, and so it asks for an interpreter. And so we can get into all of that. We can talk about and unpack what the Church of God believes. And I will tell you right now, if you want to know the Church of God believes that right there. That's what that's what the Church of God believes. And and there are 
books and articles written about um, those early believers um, that um, some had the gift of tongues, some had the gift of interpretation, but there were others that simply did it for self-glorification. And we see Paul is very, very clear about that. That does nothing about edifying the body of Christ. Nothing. Nothing. Okay? So there is order that God wants us to have in service. There is order that God wants in His church. And I think we're clear, and Paul makes it very clear on what that order is, and we, I think, we abide by that and we partner with that. And it would be great to end chapter 14 right there, but then Paul, at the end of the chapter, <laughs> man, he goes down and he just starts talking about some crazy stuff. When he says these words in verse 34, women should remain silent in the churches. Oh dear God. Why in the world, Paul, would you bring that up? And man, is that ever egotistical and wow, is that ever sexist and that's so anti-woman. Let me bring a little bit of clarity, hopefully, to that passage of Scripture right there. Uh, that scripture has been raked over the coals. I will also say I think denominations have been formed out of that scripture and the use thereof or lack thereof of that scripture. But I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell you from a biblical context what that means. It says that, that women should be silent in worship and should not speak. Remember where Paul is at. Remember where Paul is at. Don't, don't check out yet, I promise. Um, it, it's going to get good. <laughs> Remember where Paul is at. Paul is in Corinth. The men of Corinth, most of them, were trained religiously. And I'm going to say this. The women were not. Period. Um, most of the services that were done there were in Greek. And most of the women didn't speak Greek there. They had kind of a local dialect um, that could have been some, whatever the Corinthian vernacular was of the day. Let me, here's an example. This is a terrible example. Do not equate this, but I'm just trying to let you know. If you've ever been to New England, and I know many of you are from Florida, have lived in Florida, maybe you're not from Florida, but if you've ever been to New England, I mean New England, like Massachusetts and that whole area up in there, some of their words and some of the things that they say, you're like, we, are you from America? You know, do you speak English? Like my parents lived in Massachusetts for nine years and they parked the car. You did what in a where? You parked the car. Okay, that's great. Do you guys know um, my, all the times that we were there, they would say, hey, you need to go put the carriage back in the hopper. Put the who in the where? You know what a carriage is? The carriage is the actual shopping cart that you use at Publix, or the buggy, whichever you call it, back into the hopper, which is where you got it out of the store. Exactly. You guys are looking at me like, what in the world are you talking about? Exactly. Y'all know what jimmies are? You put jimmies on your cream? You put sprinkles on your ice cream? See? See? Right? That, so, so right there, you're wondering, what is going on? What is he saying? That's similar to what's going on in the Corinthian church. Don't forget. Don't forget. Most of your Corinthian synagogues, there was a middle um, aisle, open, open aisle where the rabbis would come and preach and, and, and that type of thing. On one side, all the men would sit. On the other side, all the women would sit. Now, here you go. You got a woman who over here is married to a man that's sitting all the way over here, right? And the rabbi or whoever's preaching is saying something and she is hollering over at her husband. Hey, what did he just say? Because remember, they're not understanding what he's saying. And so then you can see the husband just going, oh my gosh, whose wife is that? They, be quiet. We'll, we'll talk about this when we... That's not what you were talking about this morning at home. I don't understand what he's trying to say. And so they're doing this while the dude's preaching. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if y'all start doing that, I'm, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so... Now when Paul says, and I'm going to keep on going here, 
women should remain silent in the churches. Do you see where that's coming from? Now watch, he goes on to say, they are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home. So Paul is, once again, remember what was the first verse that he says, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And so we're talking about the structure of what good, in my Bible it says, a good order in worship is what it says. And so, think about that. If that is going on while you're trying to communicate, why, would, why wouldn't Paul say, women, you've got to be quiet for just a few minutes. Let me say what I'm trying to say. And then also, don't forget that... Um, that women were trying to understand what was being said in that role. We had many, many women believers trying to understand what is Paul or whoever is speaking about trying to say here. Because I'm not, and again, this is not a slam on women. They weren't learned from a biblical standpoint, or no, I'm going to say that, from a religious standpoint. So they're trying to understand what is he saying. And so rather than bantering back and forth between their husband, Paul said, hang on, time out. Now, another thing. And I, I'm going to be guilty of this because I can say this. I have been in several pastoral meetings before. And it's like, this has no, this does not apply to me at all. So what am I going to do? I'm going to talk to my neighbor. So remember, men are all on this side. Women are all on this side. And then the rabbi is right in the middle. And so if the women have no idea what he's talking about, let alone they don't even understand the language, what he's speaking, what are they going to begin to do? What are y'all doing for supper today? What you got? Y'all went on vacation? That is great. I hear they're doing a BBS. And so they begin to just talk about amongst themselves. Why? Because there's no connection to here. And so that's why Paul is simply saying. Now, I know some would say that's wrong interpretation. All I'm saying is remember, and if someone asks me um, that that is wrong, I, I, let me just say this. In, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Verse 5, I'm going to come to this. You don't have to turn there. But it says, But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. So that means that women can pray and prophesy in the church as well. So why would he say, be silent? Does that make sense? And again, I'm not trying to say, you know, women rise up and, you know, hear me roar and all that. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, well, that's what the scripture says. So don't take that because we have out of context that women shouldn't speak. Joel, it says that the young men is the young men dream dreams. Young men and women dream dreams. Well, I mean, there's that. So, does that make sense? Uh, maybe this will encapsulate all of that. Remember, we're still in this whole good order in worship. Listen to what one commentator said about this particular verse there about the whole. Uh, women should be silent and all this. It gets a little bit academia, textbooky at the beginning, but it comes around. The context of this prohibition would indicate that some of the women in the assembly, this is kind of things that we've already talked about, he just makes it sound so much nicer, um, <clears throat> would indicate that some, some of the women in the assembly were creating problems by asking questions and perhaps even generating arguments. Paul reminded the married women to be submitted to their husbands that's in the scripture. Um, Paul reminded the married women to be submitted to their husbands and to get their questions answered at home. We assume the unmarried women could get counsel from the elders at the synagogue or other men and their families. Sounds good? Here it is. Sad to say, listen to me, church. In too many Christian homes today, this is what the commentator said. I'm not saying he's Jesus Christ, but I'm just saying this is a great analogy and a great um, depiction of the church today in 2023. Sad to say, in too many Christian homes today, it is the wife who has to answer the questions for the husband because she is better taught in the Word. I'm going to go way off topic. Hopefully I have a job tomorrow. Women, listen to me. All women. If you need help with that, I'll help you, but Women, do not stop asking the question, about questions about the Word. Don't stop asking. Don't stop asking. Continue to dive deep into the Word of God. But let me just say this. Don't get arrogant about it. Don't get arrogant about it. 
Now hang on. Boys in the room, if you need me to help you, I'll help you. This is what I'm supposed to say. Men, get your life in the word and lead your wife. That made me sad because I heard a bunch of women say something, but I didn't hear any men, <laughs> men say anything about that. But I'm going to say it again. Men, get your life in the Word and lead your wife. Here you go. If, if you don't have a wife, get in the Word anyway. Be an, be an Ephesians 5 man of God. And then maybe, I have no idea, God's plans are perfect, and He's going to bless you with a wife who's going to be an Ephesians 5 woman. And now you've got an Ephesians 5 man and an Ephesians 5 woman Married, and now they're Ephesians 5 couple. Married people. There you go. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so, hear the urgency of what Paul is saying. Hear the sincerity of what Paul is saying. My goodness, even hear the love of what Paul is saying. Because he could have easily said, women are not permitted in the church and shouldn't be there at all and shouldn't even come. That's not what he said at all, is it? That's not what he said at all. And then he also could have been very arrogant toward the men as well. But he didn't. He didn't. Why? Because he just came out of once again. I know it's like, why do you keep going back to that? Because the word of God is true and right. He just came out of the love chapter of chapter 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. Not only from a marital standpoint, but from a body standpoint as well. So those scriptures right there had nothing to do with Paul not liking women in service. It was all about order in worship. And once again, making sure that the body, making sure that the body was built up. The word of God is alive and well. And it will mold and shape us into kingdom people and presence carriers if we let it. If we let it. The opposite would be, well, I don't like that scripture. We need to take that out. I don't like that scripture, so I'm not going to do that one. I can't believe that Paul said that about women, so I'm not going to believe it. That's, we can't pick and choose. I would see either, either say, choose all or choose none. Because the word of God is alive and well. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and your mercy in delivering that. I have been reading through chapter 14 for about three weeks, asking the Holy Spirit, what in the world are you wanting to say about this? But again, one, if you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, please find that out. We, the body needs that. The body needs that. If you are using your gifts, make sure it's edifying the body. The second thing is, is make sure in all things that you are pointing Jesus, pointing to Jesus and making sure that Jesus is exalted in the church and praise. And then the application of all of that is that God is a God of order here, here, and He's also a God of order here, here. And side note, women, you are loved and valued and appreciated, not for what you do, and men as well, but who you are, and what you bring to the table, and the gifts that you bring. <laughs> You may have to go home and wrestle with some things. I pray that you do. I pray that you go home and you challenge everything that was said here this morning. I pray that you go home and you say, God, really? I pray that you go home and say, um, God, if there's anything that's not of you in me, that you would take it out and replace it with everything that is you. And so this morning as a response, you all know this. And if this is your very first time at Northside, just know that we take a few moments at the end of every service to just say, okay, Jesus. So all that was said, all that's done the last hour and 15 minutes, okay, how does that apply to me now? How do I walk out of here and be a presence carrier? 
what is it what what is it that I need to change what is it that I need to take and God whatever what is it that I need to remove I need to ask you to remove out of my life so that then you can fill me with heaven things does that make sense and so that's what we're going to do is just take a few minutes here we're going to sing one song and so if you want to come to the altar maybe you want to pray about something that you heard this morning maybe it's about something else <laughs> Our prayer team and our pastors would love to pray with you about that. But then also just don't. Here's the temptation. Is to pray. Is to make everything quote unquote good. And say it is well with my soul. And then walk out of these doors and then live like hell. That, that's, that's the temptation. So now how do we solidify what we've heard? And so that's when we ask the spirit. Okay God seal the things that have been said. Because I know the enemy is coming after me. But I want to be a presence, a Jesus presence carrier. I want to be a kingdom kid whenever I walk into any room that the kingdom of God is there. So how do I do that, God? Because I can't do it on my own. Because I'll mess it up. So Jesus, it's got to be through your strength, through your spirit, through the gifts that you've given to me to walk in that way. So would you stand together this morning, family? God, we thank you for these next few moments. We thank you, God, for what's taken place so far. Now, God, seal these things said and sung through your spirit. We we'll commit our lives to you, blessed like only you can do. God, we'll be quick to give you all the glory and honor and praise. Let's sing together. If you want to come, we would invite you to come. One of our pastors or prayer partners would love to pray with you. Let's sing together, church. Worthy of every song we could ever sing.
God organized it. Again, God of order. So get in the Word. I don't know what I'm supposed to read. Well, there's 18 billion things online. Find a reading plan. Call me. I'll tell you. I'll read with you. If, if I'm reading 36 different reading plans with all of you, nothing would bring me more joy. When I run out, I'm going to look at Pastor Katie and say, you're up next, chick. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Because why? Oh, we're building up the body. Women, do not stop chasing the heart of God. Men, if you're not chasing the heart of God, get your hiney in gear. That's very, very Christian. Get it in gear because there are women and there are families relying on that. The church, this body is relying on the men to raise up and to raise up, rise up, but then also to raise up leaders underneath them. I'm not picking on it, but I'm thinking of Des. I can't think of a better person to raise that boy up in the things of God and the man of being a man of God. Paul, you're standing next to your son. I'm not trying to say names. Man, there's all kinds of babies. There are all those little people that left this room. Man, we've got to raise them up now. Now we have to raise them up. Not like that's a wonderful thought, Pastor. No. No, like in three minutes now. And it applies to all of us as well. Yes. <laughs> Brother 
Sam praying with him. He goes, Pastor, I didn't know how you were going to pull off that whole chapter 14. I said, bro, I didn't either. That's by the grace of God. Grab the person's hand next to you. Will you come up next to me? So Jesus, here we are. Your body, your bride. Each member desiring God to do its part. But when we're not here, we're not doing our part, God, we suffer. So we know that we are needed, we are valued, we are cherished, we are loved. Not only by this body, but oh God, by you, the Almighty. And so Father, we join together this day. We join together and we say, as for this house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be courageous as we share your word, as we are presence carriers. God, will it be hard? Absolutely. But it says in your word somewhere, Father, that you have overcome the world. Hallelujah to your name. We will take heart. It says in your word that you will never leave us or forsake us. And so, God, we're going to stand on that. We're going to build our life on that, as the song says, and as chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians says. We're going to build our life on that. So, Lord, as we, as we leave this place, we are encouraged, we are strengthened, we're challenged. Go before us, Father. May your spirit lead us in every word that we say, in every thought that we think, in every action. Father, whatever we do, may we edify and build up the body of Christ. Jesus, we thank you for today. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So we thank you for this day. May you be praised. May you be glorified. And everything that continues to be done today, for it is in the mighty name of Jesus that we ask these things. And together as a body, we said, Amen, Amen. Well, hey, make sure that you look at somebody next to you. You can shake their hand. You can hug them. Say, I'm praying for you. I can't wait to hear about what you're reading. And then enjoy your week.